cabinet should be equity in the world. <laughs> Now then crew and welcome back to the Andy Mechanic YouTube channel and this is for memory episode 4 of the work that we're doing on the, the old 1970, what is it, 1976 it was registered here in New Zealand, it's a Honda CB750 K2, looks a bit different to the last videos because I've pulled the fuel tank off the seat and the side panels and I've stowed those away because they were getting a little bit dusty and I don't want to scratch the tank because it's in mint condition. Now, in previous videos, we basically were starting to look at why this engine is so hard to start. It did run, we had it running, um, but it was, number two cylinder was the big problem. It wasn't firing when the engine was cold. And as it warmed up, it finally came on song. Worked, that's, sorry, Yorkshire term. Um, so, we did some compression tests and bits and pieces and we found out there is a mechanical issue with the engine where the compression is down and it's worst on, believe it or not, cylinder number two. But also we found that the sparks uh, on the spark plugs very, very weak, only able to jump about a five millimeter gap uh, in atmosphere and it should be able to jump at least seven millimeters gap. And the bigger the gap, the higher the voltage. Simple as that really. So I've pulled off the ignition coils. So we're going to do, run through some very basic checks on those. I've got some specifications. I've been searching around uh, around the internet trying to find stuff. Uh, the, I do have the genuine Honda service manual, but that didn't give me all the information I needed. So some of the specs in this video might also be helpful for you guys that are doing a similar job. Right, let's get to it and uh, let's check some resistance on the primary and secondary windings of those two coils first. Here we go. Right, first job, let's get the old plug caps taken off. Try and get you in the camera there. So this is plug cap for cylinder number one. And we're going to test these separately. But you've got to take them off to do the secondary winding test. Because these are a resistor type plug cap. Right, stick that over there. And we've got, this is plug cap number four. Dum -de -dum -dum -dum. There we go. And this one is off cell number three. And I labeled everything up because I need to know where it came from. Because remember, cylinder number two is a real problem at the moment. Right, last one, cell number two. Oh, that's not good. Okay, probably not the issue, but still needs to be replaced. the hell? Get some pliers, hang on. We've got a bit missing look on the wire. The outer sheathing's gone. I think it's stuck in here. Oh, look at that. It's cracked. It's come off. That's not going to help matters, especially when given the fact that there's a a crack, the rubber's torn on the boot, so on a wet day, water's going to get in there, and then it's going to, obviously that's already failed, it's going to get through, and potentially we could have some shorting out, so it would drop off, potentially it would drop off cylinder number two, and you'd have a misfire, okay, even when it's warm. Right, so we'll get rid of those. Okay, let's get this thing set up in the vise. And then we can do some more tests. Let's do the primary windings first. Okay, let's get our meter fired up. So we want to put this on to 200 ohms. And I'm going to introduce, not only am I using the multimeter, but I also want to use a fly lead as well. So we need to measure the overall resistance, including the fly lead. And we've got 0.4 of an ohm. Right, okay. So... I think what we'll do is we'll use the fly lead down here. Other end, there we are, look. Can you see okay? I think you can. Are you in focus? I think you are. There we go. 
right that's down there and then we're going to stick that onto the negative probe and then all we need to do now is connect onto the other side of the primary which is the black with the white tracer doesn't matter which way around you wire these up i could have put the red probe onto that one doesn't matter we're just testing resistance and i've also cleaned up the terminal because these are pretty rough to be honest and what have we got we've got can you see that okay we can just we've got 4.7 minus the 0.4 of internal resistance including the fly lead so we've got 4.3 ohms for the primary winding of ignition coil that does cylinders two and three Okay, let's write that down, 4.3. Right, 4.3 ohms. Okay, let's do the primary for the other coil now, coil that does cylinders one and four. Hockley dockley. All right, we'll move that across. Stick it down that way. Make sure you get a good connection, otherwise it'll set it all out, so we'll give it a bit of a rub around. There we go. And we've got our probe, we're still connected, so we'll now we'll go on to the black with the white on this one, on the bit that I've cleaned up. And 4.5 less the 0.4, so 4.1 for that one. Right, 4.1 ohms. Okay, now the specification for these is 4.6 plus or minus 10%. Well, 4.6 basically minus 0.4 would be 4.2 minimum and basically 5 maximum. So that one's good. 4.1. Ooh, we're getting really, really close on that one. Okay. Right. Secondary winding. Okay. So now, all we need to do, remove that, put our meter onto the 20,000 ohms or 20k ohms on there. Uh, the spec is about 15,000 ohms. That's what I've been able to sort of do through my research. And to measure it, dead easy, you just get the two high-tension high leads out of the same coil. And essentially, you just stuff in your probes in there, look. That's one. That's two. What do we get? Now, this is the coil one and four cylinders. And we've got 14.13. Let's go for that. 14.13. 14.13 ohms right one more to go okay now the coil that does cylinders two and three and exactly the same just grab the two ht leads and stuff up your probe feels a bit sloppy inside there what have we got 14.35 Three six. Three six. Fourteen point three six. Fourteen point three six kilo ohms. Cool. Right, well what's next? We need to do the plug caps. Now, do you can see or not? You can just wrong way around. There we are. These are well they're labelled up as a five kilo ohm resistance plug cap and these are ngk high quality very happy with those doesn't mean to say they're any good though they could be pretty old so we need to test them okay so plug caps it's always good to make a note of everything and the spec is five kilo ohms now i've been on the internet and verified that they are the right specification resistance caps for this particular bike and we're going to have four different readings so one two three four hopefully darkly right where should we start well we should start with number one shouldn't we really where's number one there he is okay so to do this we need to remove the grommets the seals well that's pretty 
pretty knackered isn't it it's all perished and there's bits missing out of it that's not good at all a fail we'll get rid of that and let's have a little look inside first okay hopefully it's going to focus for you so we're looking down inside the cap oh geez inside the cap for any kind of sort of tracking marks and stuff it's a bit grubby in there but i can't see any tracking marks as such just dirt you can't really see down there can you not so good how's that there you go so you can see the dirt down the side but no tracking marks as such okay so resistance check we need our meter and 20k ohms is fine again because we're going to measure five there we are look and we'll use our fly lead again so we'll stick our fly lead on this end where the ht lead goes and we'll connect that to the negative probe like we did last time and then all we need to do now is make contact inside where the spark plug connects and this is for uh, plug cap cylinder number one we've got 4.82 kilo ohms where's my pen 4.82 kilo ohms right so we'll get rid of that one stick it over there with all the bits right so plug cap number two now remember we had a bit of a bit of the ht lead stuck in there didn't we that outer sheathing so that's not good and we had that rip where was it there we are look we had that rip in the top as well which is going to allow moisture to get in and of course that's going to compromise the uh, the insulation even further and you know potentially cause a misfire right let's get the end piece off oh look at that hey it's full of oil that's not good so maybe we've got a rocket cover gasket leak as well that's certainly not going to help there's me rag Let's give me a little screwdriver hang on now unfortunately because of the oil we're probably not going to be able to see any tracking marks it's going to clean it off when i try and get the oil out but not a lot of choice really let's have a look this one looks it feels different it feels just take this is cylinder number three let's just take the ends off that one yeah it's got some oil on it as well look jeez yeah we feel about the same it just felt light okay this one however is not an ngk plug cap you can see look there's the equivalent one for cylinder number three and it's got the old ngk stamp on it meaning quality this one just looks a spurious brand so i'm already i'm already not very happy with this i don't know who made it where it's from it's got no ratings on it it's it's a variable i don't like variables when you're doing diagnostics you need to know fixed you know fixed information okay so onto the test for this one we'll plug that onto the where the ht lead goes again there you go and get that positive probe and we're going to go the same just in there look what have we got make sure we're on properly test the meter meter's working fine oh hey that one's open circuit that's not good let's just crank up the ohms see if we can get a some kind of a reading out of it no nothing completely open circuit that is junk where's my pen holy moly eh, eh. 
Well, that's not going to help with the spark, is it? No one had a weak spark. It's ridiculous. Right, that's all the bits for that one. I'll stick those over there. Okay, uh, now, cylinder number three. We've done that one, the plug cap number three. We've already taken the bits off, so we can quickly test that one. In fact, let's write down that first of all. Open circuit. Okay. Right, now, plug cap number three. Exactly the same test. We're back on 20k ohms. And we've got 5.58. 5.58. Okay, one more to go. Get rid of that one. Get all the bits next to it. Hey, come back. Okay. So looking at this one, this is slightly different. This one's, they're all a bit different. This one's, what's it look like? About 60 degree, 75 degree bend on it. Uh, again, NGK. And number two isn't, number one is, and number three is. So three out of four is not bad, is it, I suppose? Well done. Okay. So we'll take the end. Oh, nice and dry. We like that. I'm just looking down inside. Hang on, autofocus, please. Thank you. There we are. So, just looking down inside, I know it's probably not going to be that easy to see on camera. Yeah, we've definitely got some marks down there. You can see that or not. Right down the bottom, down there, we've got some, some marks. Doesn't look like tracking marks though. Just looks like a rub mark where it's been rubbing against the against the plug. Maybe somebody hasn't put it on properly in the past. Anyway, not so good. Again, judging by the condition of these rubbers, this looks like it's quite old because they're all cracked and perished again. Okay, let's pop that on there. Do our last test. What have we got? What's going on there? I think we've got another one that's open circuit. Just test the meter. Meter's fine. Hey, that's not good. Has it got any markings on it? Yeah, if you can see that or not, it had, does say on there just. I don't know if you can read it or not, but it says 5k ohms just there. Look, well, you can, you can just see that, can't you? Okay, so why are we not getting a reading again? Oh, that's not good at all, is it? Okay, so number four plug cap is also open circuit. Jeez. Just while I've got it connected, oh hang on a minute, yeah, just while I've got it connected, I just want to try it one more time. No, nothing. Let's just go up to 200k, see if we get a reading on that. No. Oh, there's a reading. Let's just go back down. No. Wow. Okay. Very high resistance. It's not good. Keep checking the meter. Make sure it's not the leads. No. Okay. That's junk. Wow. Two out of four plug caps are shot. Eh, eh. Golly. So, some pretty basic tests, just using an ordinary sort of multimeter. This one's not particularly expensive. You know, you can pick up this sort of style multimeter from any of your auto shops around the place. And it means, obviously, the more money you spend, the more accurate they're going to be. But for this kind of testing, one of these is just fine. And it's allowed us to identify a number of problems 
Um, as regards the secondary winding resistance, we got, reading backwards, 14.36 on the coil that provides cylinders 2 and 3, because it's a wasted spark system. And we've got coil that provides uh, cylinders 1 and 4, we've got 14.13. Now, from what I can gather on the internet, the specification is about 15,000 ohms, or 15k ohms. Um, I don't think we're that far out. I think those are fine. As regards the primaries, again, sort of pretty damn close. I don't think we've actually got an ignition coil problem that's resulting in this weak spark issue. Um, I think a new set of plug caps and also we also found that the spark plug gap hadn't been adjusted it came out of the it was about 0.9 to 1 millimeter of plug gap between the electrode we saw that in a previous video uh, I'll get a new set of plugs for it uh, NGK obviously not that they're a sponsor but I like NGK plugs and I'll set the gap to what it should be which is 0.6 to 0.7 millimeters uh, with the new plug caps, and then we're also going to, uh, you know, re do a, a new spark test. But there are other factors, many other factors actually, that can cause the spark to be weak. And with this being a points ignition motorcycle, uh, it has two sets of ignition points. If the point points contact surface is pitted or corroded, uh, and it's not really, uh, and therefore a, a there's a resistance between the two halves of the points that can cause a volt drop uh, and not provide sufficient current to charge up the primary winding. And then when it does collapse, you know, the, the resulting spark is weak. So the next part of this video, I think we'll have a, an initial look at the points. Uh, maybe I'll pull a set out and we'll take a look on the bench and see what kind of condition they're in because you can't see a lot on the bike. So I'll do that. So let's go and pull some points out. Now, like we saw in one of the previous videos, the points are inside here and there's going to be a, another video a bit further on where uh, we look at these in a lot more detail on how they operate and possibly if needed replacement of the points and the condensers and of course doing the ignition timing because that is the ignition timing is absolutely critical to uh, getting a good spark and of course having an engine that actually runs properly as well if you get the, the dwell period, that's the period of time the points are closed, if that's insufficient, then you don't get enough energy built up in the primary to get a good spark. There we go, look. Okay, what do we need? Well, these are the condensers, and these are the two sets of points. And there's a set of points for each ignition coil. And you can see that's how they operate. You see, look, they run on a cam that's on the, on the end of the crankshaft. And they open and close. So we're going to take a set of points out and take a look. So I need to undo that little tiny screw there, look, which has got two wires on it. Make sure they're all tight. First of all, they are. That's cool. Okay. God knows what tiny little spanner size that is. I think a pair of needle nose pliers is required. And that could be even a number three Allen key. Right. We need some tools. Now, I know the commenters, there's going to be some haters out there now. But seriously, I don't have a spanner. I have a little socket, probably. But I don't have a spanner small enough for that. It's probably about a 4 or a 5 mil. Probably about a 4 mil, actually. And then we can just pull those out. That's one. Two. Now, the blue wire, that's the feed... Uh, sorry, well, actually, that's coming from the ignition coil, from the primary. And the green and, and the blue wire is just basically the points are grounded. This comes from the ignition primary. And uh, the primary has been fed 12 volts, ignition voltage. And when these points close, then it puts this wire, the blue wire, to ground to complete the circuit. And then that primary winding charges up, so to speak. And the condenser is there to stop the points arcing all the time. So you get a nice clean, either it's almost like binary, either the points are open and there's no circuit, or the points are closed and there is uh, current flowing. What we don't want is it to be intermittent, you know, because if it's 
if it's sort of opening, if, if the current flow is sporadic, then we're going to get lots of little tiny sparks and it's not going to work very well. So you have to have well, well operating condensers to control the, uh, the points as regards the arcing element. So the, the current supply is clean cut. That's a good way of putting it. Gee, that's tight. Hang on there. there we go. Now, obviously, by taking them out, it's going to destroy their current setting. That's just the way it goes. It makes it more fun to set them up again. We have no, we don't know if they're set properly or not, to be honest. But that one there should give us an indication. Okay, I'm just going to pop that screw back in there again, so we don't lose it. There we go. Right, we have one of the sets of points. Now, this is the blue wire, so we can work out which uh, set of coils this one feeds. I'll find that out for you. And then, what we need to do now is take a look at those contacts, see what kind of condition they're in. We could even bench test them. The ignition points. Old school, but I do like this kind of stuff. Now, what we're interested in is the contact surface just under here, that surface there, and if I can turn it around, the surface on this side here as well. Now, you can already see that there's some pretty bad pitting on there. So I'm gonna set up the, the microscope camera for you so we can get a really good look and see how bad they are. And then we're gonna bench test it using a, um, a little test light and a battery. There we go, not bad is it? So you can see this is one of the contact patches on the points and you can see on here look there's all sorts of pitting, scarring, there's little divots all over the place, there's even some black sort of carbon residue going on. It's not good, it's not in very good condition. Right, I'm going to show you how I did this now. <laughs> it's not easy. Look at that. That's what you're looking at. Bloody cool, aren't they? What a machine. Modern technology. Okay, let's have a look at the other side of the points next. There we go, look. So now, again, you can see on the point surface, this should be nice and smooth. And you can see we've got all sorts of irregularities on there, burning, we've got bits of metal stuck in there off the other the other contacts you can see all around here look so the points in general are in extremely bad condition of these contacts and they need to be replaced this is not good for the ignition system it needs all the help it can get on these old school ignition systems to get a good spark it needs to be replaced so let's see if i can rub my uh, rub the screwdriver across the surface oh look at that and it's actually actually extremely rough yeah there's all sorts of stuff going on there very badly burnt not being well looked after either needs replacing or at least cleaning up these little cameras, microscope camera I think it's called, absolutely brilliant for this kind of stuff. I think it cost me about $30 New Zealand. I use it for all sorts of stuff and you can dial in you know, the, um, the focus on here. Um, you, I think you can take a picture with it as well but I've not worked out how, how that works yet. But uh, ultra useful when you're getting old like me and you can't, <laughs> you can't see shit with your normal eyes anymore. Bloody good. And one day I'll get the screen capture software working again and I won't need to film the screen. But it's, it came out pretty good, didn't it? Okay, so what's next? Well, we've, we've identified that the ignition points are in a really bad condition. Um, whether the ignition timing was out or not, I have no idea. And it's too late to check that. But I'm going to basically uh, source a new set of ignition points. Uh, I think a new set of condensers as well at the same time because they're not expensive and they are a serviceable item. They do need to be replaced on a regular basis. Um, you know, not only over usage, but over time as well. So I think, you know, since we're doing this bike up, we need to give it the best possible chance. 
And with those poor old ignition coils, yeah, they are probably getting a little bit long in the tooth. They're very old. This bike's nearly 50 years old, don't forget. Um, but replacing them, it's a possibility. Uh, again, I was searching through the net this morning, and you can get aftermarket, and they look to be reasonable quality. I'll, I'll, again, I'll, I'll search through the forums and try and get some kind of feedback. But you can get new ignition coils, so it may well be that that's what Alan wants to do with the bike. Although, I think the first thing to do is refresh everything else. New plug caps, new plugs with the right gap, new ignition points, new condensers. Set up the ignition timing correctly and see if that basically overcomes that low cylinder compression causing poor engine start. We're not looking to get the bike into A1 tip-top condition for ultimate performance, but we do need the bike to start easily and be reliable. If we can avoid a top end rebuild, we will. So let's work on the ignition system first. If we can get that working correctly, then we're going to have to attack uh, the mechanical side of the engine and do a rebore, new pistons and rings, lapping the valves, that kind of stuff. But you know, we've only got four months and we don't know how long the parts are going to take to get here. We've got COVID-19 at the moment around the world, and that's dramatically reducing parts supply. Um, and the parts that you can get are taking a very long time to get here. Okay, what we can do now, just to highlight the problems with those points, is a quick bench test using a test light and a battery. Let's see how we get on. Here we go. Hoo-hoo! I love playing with stuff. So I decided not just to use a bulb, but also put an electromagnet, basically just a coil of wire, very similar to what's in the ignition coil, in circuit as well, uh, wired in parallel with the bulb, so we can actually see some real current going through these points, and you'll see the arcing. So, got the uh, electromagnet, got the coil, got the points, currently with a bit of cardboard stuck in there to break the circuit. All I need to do now is open the points manually and then close the points. Look at that. And if you don't believe me, it's not electromagnet. Look at that. So it's off. If I just hang it there, look. On. Woohoo! And that wasn't me. <laughs> it takes a while to lose power as well. Right, you ready? Fantastic. One more. Oh, yeah, you see I wasn't holding it enough. There you go. Oh, it's pretty cool. I can even feel the feel the feel. Right, let me show you the arcing on those points. Now this will sort of really replicate the amount of current that's going through the ignition coil. I don't know exactly how much it is, but you can work it out from the resistance that we've just uh, measured. So, if we open up, get rid of the cardboard, and now we've got the electromagnet still in, uh, in circuit and the bulb. I've taken them out of shot because I didn't want it to affect the camera. There you go. Look, you see, imagine these things are opening and closing really quickly. And what you're looking for is the arcing. You see the little sparks that have been developed? Now, we haven't got a condenser in circuit. So that if we had a condenser, it would certainly reduce the amount of arcing. But you can see that that's going to create damage to the surface of the points over time. And that's why there are servicing a serviceable item that needs to be inspected, cleaned, the gap reset, because they wear down. Oh yeah, look, you see that was a good one, wasn't it? And that's why one of the reasons why engines ignition systems have gone away from using points because they have so many limitations. And there will be more videos covering points in the near future. I've got I have a plan. Right. I thought what might be quite useful, and the last thing for this video, because it's all about learning stuff, isn't it, is we're going to get the scope rigged up, and we're going to measure the voltage each time the points close, and see if there's much of a discrepancy um, because of the damage on the surface. You know, each time those points make contact, they make contact in a very slightly different position, and the resistance will change, and that will affect the voltage. So I'll get the scope rigged up, and we'll see what we get. Woohoo! Now, I don't know how successful this is going to be, but it should be a bit of fun. So we'll just start the scope. There we go. Take out my bit of cardboard. And now I can just 
open and close the points and what I'm looking for really is a discrepancy between the voltage supplied each time the points close it's probably going to be neg negligible but with the amount of pitting on there it's not going to make you know the resistance is going to be different every time those points close and that's what I'm interested in Oh, misfire. <laughs> right, stick a bit of cardboard back in. We'll stop the uh, scope. And we'll go back. There we go. Okay, so I'm just going to zoom. Beauty of touch screen is great, isn't it? Zoom in. I just want to measure the voltage real quickly. Because we are going off down a rabbit hole at the moment. Is there much difference? No. No, there really isn't, is there? It's not too bad. We didn't get any misfires. When you get really badly pitted points, sometimes they just don't make contact at all. And when that happens, you actually do get a misfire on the engine. That was me, <laughs> by the way. But we didn't get any points along the, pardon the pun, we didn't get any points where there was the points were closed and there was no current flow because there was no contact due to, you know, excessive pitting and burning of the surface. So they do sort of still work, but they're not great. Okay, crew, well, that was a whole lot of fun. I thoroughly enjoyed that last little bit. And uh, it sort of highlights the importance of... Good maintenance on your ignition points. Not many people will recognize these anymore, will they? Very strange. There's a lot of mechanics out there that don't know how to... Jeez, that really is badly pitted. Um, they just don't know how to service, replace, or the importance of maintaining ignition points. It's a dying art. And that's why I want to do some more videos on it. I'm by no means an expert, but I do understand the basics. And I certainly appreciate the importance of them being in serviceable condition and set correctly. And like I said, there'll be more videos on that. Okay, so a quick summary then. What did we find wrong with Alan's CB750 K2 of the 2000, sorry, the 1976, was it? Vintage? I forget now. Yeah, it was registered in 1976. I think it's actually a 1975 bike. Well, we found that the primary winding on both of the two ignition coils is sort of within spec, just. Uh, the secondary winding on both ignition coils is, again, sort of just in spec. I think it is acceptable. I'll be making some more inquiries uh, just to validate that, because there's no specification in the Honda service manual for the resistance value of those secondary windings. It's just not there. What they do is say they direct the technician to using a special Honda test meter uh, and that that proves that the coil is working fine. And essentially they're measuring the spark gap, how far the spark will jump. We've already done that, um, but we didn't do it in isolation of just the coil being tested. It was on the bike with the whole ignition system working. So any reduction in uh, secondary uh, high tension voltage, secondary winding voltage, could be due to many different issues. One is, it could be the points being pitted would reduce uh, the spark voltage. If the dwell angle, if the points gap is not set correctly, the ignition timing is incorrect. It all affects um, the, the final outcome, you know, the, the spark voltage. So it's important now that we look at each individual component and, and address problems that we find with each one, whether we replace it, clean it up, reset it, whatever needs to be done. But we need to get this bike reliable. More importantly, what we did find, which is a very common issue with these bikes, so it seems on the forums, and yes, I know I do read the internet as well, uh, we found that uh, plug cap number four, open circuit, we found that plug cap number two, the non-NGK, the spurious one, again, open circuit, not good. Not only is it way outside spec, it's just junk. 
It really is. There's no specifications on it, no nothing, and the meter got zero reading. Well, say zero, it got an open circuit reading. Same with plug cap number four. Uh, plug caps uh, number three and one were within spec. They were. They look pretty old, and the rubbers are quite perished. So the bottom line is replace all four. I never just replace one anyway. Just put a new set on, have done with it. We have no idea of the history of these, how old they are, that kind of stuff. So you've just watched the episode four of the uh, the resurrection of <laughs> of Alan's CB750 K2 model Honda. And there's going to be a lot more videos to come by the looks of it. And I'm trying to chip away at all this work. I've got a bit of a deadline, which is uh, I've set myself, which is November, because Alan wants to be able to ride the bike in December on the road and it be reliable. Uh, not only is there engine faults or are there engine faults to deal with, there's a number of other issues around the frame of the bike, other bits and pieces to do, and the bike needs to go through certification again. It's deregistered, so I've got a ton of work to do. There's a, I, I can't emphasize how much work there is to get done on this bike, and if we have to do a top-end rebuild, that has to be an engine out to do that, and that's going to incur a lot more time and effort and expense. It'll all be worth it, I'm sure. Okay, crew, well, if you enjoyed the video, why not click on the subscribe button? You'll see a little gear icon. I think it's on that side. I could be wrong. It could be either side. Who knows? Click on the subscribe button uh, and then, uh, you know, turn on notifications. And our friends at YouTube will send you an email as and when I upload any new videos. You'll also find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Feel free to communicate through any of those portals. There's also a Patreon page, you can read all about the history of the channel, how it came to be, and of course there's lots of pictures and videos and stuff that you can download of the gorgeous Tool Girls. And yes, there's no Tool Girl in the workshop today, I know, terrible shame, but uh, Tool Girl Holly has just gone through some surgery and she'll be back in the next few weeks. Looking forward to getting Holly back in the workshop, and we've got lots planned uh, on her new farm bike. We've got uh, a whole motorcycle to go through. Lots of faults that we found in the previous video that we're going to work our way through as well. So I really have got my work cut out between that bike and this one and all the regular jobs that come through the workshop and my day job. Jeez, never ends, does it? Uh, what else? If you want to donate, you can do that through PayPal. And if you want to get yourself uh, any of the Andy Mechanic merch, you can do that through the official Andy Mechanic uh, website which is or the merch site which is on Zazzle and again there's a link down the bottom in the description if you want to send me an email again my email address is in the description feel free can't guarantee I reply I always do my best but you know I am an extremely busy chap okay crew well until next time I'll see you around cheers over and out Get the, get the, get the. Oh! <laughs>